Okay, this is inflammatory depression, the real reason why more than 30% of patients are treatment resistant. I am Dr. Michael Grudadoria, and I am a functional medicine and functional neurological chiropractor in New York, and I am the founder of the Same Here Global Doctors Alliance, uh, working with mental health patients in conjunction with the Psych Alliance and Dr. Andrew Kleiner, who's an integrative psychiatrist um, in Florida. I'll say more about same here uh, at the end. So we're going to talk a little bit about depression today. Depression is not a disease. Depression is a state of the brain that negatively affects how people feel, the way they think, how motivated they, how motivated they are, and how they act. There are many causative and contributory factors, both mental and physical, and understanding the biochemistry, genetics, and the neurology allows clinicians to help people heal versus just addressing symptoms. So we've been, you know, we've been led to believe all these years that this is a disease and we need talk therapy and medication. I mean, what we're realizing now is that it's, it's, it's quite a different thing. It's actually, um, you know, a full body, emotional and physical experience and very commonly a spiritual one as well. Treatment resistant. So generally people are labeled treatment resistant uh, after they don't respond to existing treatments. So Although the main current treatments for depression are pharmacological and pharma, uh, psychotherapeutic, up to 30% or, or more of patients do not respond to either option. So a third of the people are not responding to what we're doing, so we call them treatment resistant. But are they treatment resistant or are they just resisting the current treatment approach? So treatment resistant depression, Here's this is... Um, a journal article from Neuroscience and, and Biobehavioral Reviews from 2018, where they looked at a multi-scale systems biology report, and they came up with the fact that 50% of depressed patients are inad inadequately treated by available interventions. So when we have 20% of the population suffering with a condition where only half of them are, inadequate, uh, are adequately treated, it's time to change the paradigm. We have to start thinking differently. This is not acceptable. Depression is affecting insane numbers of people, and we're not doing a good enough job. Chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation is a state of the body that leads to neuroinflammation or brain-based inflammation, which causes the neurological dysfunction that creates depression and anxiety. Eventually, the same neuroinflammation will cause neurodegeneration and Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So if you Google inf the words inflammation and depression, uh, within less than half a second, you'll see that there's 212 million hits connecting those two words. So there's a, a pretty strong correlation between the two. So here are some more journal articles. The role of neuroinflammation and neurovascular dysfunction in major depressive disorder. Selected biomarkers of depression. What are the effects of cytokines and inflammation? Uh, the bidirectional relationship of depression and inflammation, double trouble. And depression, the radical theory linking it to inflammation. So here's one, one thing that's you know I want to really make a point of. This article number two here in, in International Journal of Molecular Sciences talks about selected biomarkers. Right now, there are no biomarkers for depression. Somebody goes in to see their doctor. They explain their feelings, their emotions, uh, their lack of energy, their sleep disruption, their um, you know lack of motivation, and so on. And they say, I am depressed. And the doctor says, Yes, you are depressed, and essentially the, the prescription pad comes out, and we write them a prescription to treat the neurotransmitter insufficiency, the serotonin deficiency. And what we're realizing is that, you know, that's actually not the truth. Um, it's actually been tr disproven that that's, you know, that's the, you know, the primary effect of antidepressant medications. Um, so let's look at some of these articles. The role of neuroinflammation and neurovascular dysfunction in uh, major depressive disorder from 2018. So neuroinflammation, this process, this, this biochemical change is involved in the, in the development of depression by increasing these chemicals called pro-inflammatory cytokines. This affects the hypothalamus, pituitary adrenal axis, the HPA axis, increasing, increases uh, glucocorticoid resistance and affects serotonin synthesis and metabolism and neuronal apoptosis and neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. Basically all very, very big words for 
This inflammation changes the way the brain works and how the brain then changes the stress response. Here's another one, selected biomarkers. So again, you know, when, when a, somebody goes and sees, uh, you know, the psychiatrist, very, very commonly, in fact, most of the time, there's, there, there is no blood test, you know, that says, hey, let's test you for depression. Um, you know, these doctors are, are amazing at, at, you know, with their training, but their, their mode of treatment is we're going to prescribe medication. And very commonly, these medications work um, and make people feel better, but up to 30% of the time, they don't. And the reason why they work largely is because now we're realizing that SSRI medications have an anti-inflammatory effect on the central nervous system. And there's also a, a very large um, feeling of, you know, the placebo effect. So, you know, in certain cases, there are, you know, neurotransmitter issues. And, and you know, we, we understand that. And, you know, we'll, we'll actually speak a little bit to that. But we know that these cytokines, hormones, oxidative stress markers, neuropeptides, they're all studied in association, in association with depression. So these are chemical markers that we can see in people, and we know that they are associated, so we should be testing for them. The latest research into inflammatory cytokines shows their relationship with the etiology or development of depression and that they're causative, that inflammation causes depression. Here it is, very plain to see in, in an International Journal of Molecular Sciences in 2022. We can't ignore this data. Here's another one, increased C-reactive protein concentration and suicidal behavior in people with psychiatric disorders. So increased C-reactive protein, C-reactive protein is a, is a marker of inflammation that is created by the liver in response to infl inflammation and these other inflammatory chemicals called cytokines. The results are that out of initial 550 references, 21 observational studies, that involved 7,682 uh, 7, people were included and a significant association of CRP levels, inflammation levels with suicidality emerged, meaning that people with depression that also had elevated levels of CRP or high sensitivity CRP, there is a link between the fact that these are the people that we, we may feel will die by suicide. Pretty important thing to know when you have somebody who is depressed. So testing for inflammation. Now, all doctors, all clinicians can run these tests. The two in red, high sensitivity CRP and ESR, they're the most commonly and you know easily run tests that are done by every single lab. These are the standard tests for inflammation. There are others, and I'm gonna to speak to them. But while these inflammatory tests may not always be be elevated, we can't assume that inflammation is not present, which is the tricky part, which means we have to know more. We have to know more than the standard. Commonly, these are elevated, and it's associated with other metabolic issues, and I'll show you that down the road. But these other tests can be, can be done to also reflect an inflammatory process, something called homocysteine, which is um, an amino acid that elevates with altered methylation. Uh, we know that it's an independent risk factor for heart disease as well. Ferritin. Ferritin is storage iron, but in, in many cases, when, under the, the guise of uh, an inflammatory process, ferritin is very, very high. It acts as what we call an acute phase reactant. Fibrinogen, calprotectin. Calprotectin is a measure of intestinal inflammation, direct link between intestines and brain. Interleukin-1, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, uh, TNF-alpha, these are all inflammatory chemicals that can be tested through the blood to show that somebody is chronically inflamed. And the number one, you know, the, the research talked about this CRP level directly being related to suicidal ideation and actually suicide. So what is inflammation? Inflammation is a normal chemical and cellular response of the body to toxins, injury, or infection. So anytime we have an injury or we are exposed to toxins or we have an infection, our body becomes inflamed, and that's normal. It's a protective response, okay? These situations cause a release of these things called cytokines and blood cells, like white blood cells specifically, that further activate the immune system. And in a normal setting, once this threat is neutralized, the immune system quiets down again. And this is a normal inflammatory response. We call it acute inflammation. 
Chronic inflammation, however, is a state in which this activation doesn't stop. After a short period of time, it switches from a healing response to a destructive force. And people with chronic inflammation are the ones that have chronic metabolic issues, and those are the ones that have a significant increase in this um, you know, inflammatory depression. So here's a, a very cool chart. And what we see is in the middle on the left is chronic inflammation. This chemical reaction that just doesn't stop. So we see some arrows that are going to it, like this arrow in the top here on the left. Poor sleep. Poor sleep can cause chronic inflammation. Poor diet. Gastrointestinal issues like IBS or inflammatory bowel disease. Or an infection in the gut, like let's say somebody ends up with uh, food poisoning. That can cause something called gut dysbiosis. And gut dysbiosis, which is an imbalance in the bacteria in the gut, can actually cause chronic inflammation. And those are bidirectional. So inflammation in the body can cause gut inflammation and so on. And you see all these things on the left, they're all triggers of chronic inflammation. So non-native electromagnetic frequencies, being overexposed to blue light, sitting in front of a computer all day, sitting under fluorescent lights, uh, looking at a, a, you know, at, a, at a cell phone all day long, that is non-native EMF. Our brain can't handle those particular frequencies. MTHFR is... Um, it's a, a gene mutation or a SNP, SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism that actually involves folate metabolism, vit vitamin B9 metabolism. Mitochondrial issues, mitochondria are like the powerhouse of the cell. They produce ATP from our food. Issues with the mitochondria can create chronic inflammatory issues. Alcohol, poor diet, those are two biggies. Um, high blood sugar, which is you know chronic in our country because we eat so many carbs. Obesity, which is rampant among you know even children and adults gastrointestinal issues, which affect, you know, half the population. Low level sun exposure can cause chronic inflammation, a lack of exercise, poor nutrient status, low resilience. Okay. Like, you know, we have, we're, we're creating gener you know, a generation of young people that are not very resilient because they're, they're not exposed to as much, um, you know, they're, they're disconnected from actual interactions with people so when they get into situations where they have to interact with people and not just via their via their cell phone, you know they're they're stressed, they're overstressed. Toxins, um, you know, we we understand that um, you know overall stress levels, um, high ACE score, which is adverse childhood events. So when children are exposed to high levels of stress as as young, you know, in in their younger ages, that can cause a chron chronic inflammatory reaction in the body. Obviously, emotional trauma. And you see that chronic inflammation in the middle causes uh, stress chemistry to change. And that causes elevated cortisol responses. And then that affects sleep. You know, all of these things are all interrelated. But basically, chronic inflammation is at the root of all the things on the right. All of these things are all inflammatory disorders. But we label them as independent problems. And we give them like designation as diseases. So we look at depression, insomnia, anxiety, migraine, fatigue, brain fog, dementia, obesity, metabolic syndrome. Every single one of those things is actually an inflammatory disorder, all related to the same problems that can create um, inflammatory depression. So here's a cool graphic that looks at you know, how stress and if stress in the upper left and inflammation over here um, you know, affect NF-kappa B in the brain. And that can change the, the production of neurotransmitters, increases something called excitotoxicity, and decreases neurotrophic factors, which actually help with brain regeneration. So all of these things are all involved, both stress, emotional stress, and physiological changes like inflammation. So this is one that, that really is not talked about enough. And this is the interaction between inflammation and the production of serotonin. So commonly, we talk about serotonin so much because we prescribe SSRI medication, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. These, this is the first line therapy in as far as uh, medication for depression um, across the country, across the world. Um, you know things like Prozac and and Zoloft and so on. These are these are SSRI medications. But what we don't really talk about is the fact that tryptophan, which is the amino acid that becomes serotonin can also go down a different route called the kynurene pathway. So tryptophan generally will turn into serotonin and also turns into a little bit of kynurene. However, 
when we have an inflamed body, when we have all those scenarios I was describing a moment ago going on, inflammation will trigger this IDO enzyme and upregulate the tryptophan down the kynurene pathway, reducing the amount of serotonin we make and increasing something called quinolinic acid, which is neurotoxic. This is how inflammation actually changes serotonin synthesis. And this is how they think that um, SSRI medications may be helpful because it, re it reduces the inflammation neurologically. And I think that they have to come up with a plan to say that because you know, we know that this isn't strictly a serotonin issue, it's an inflammatory one. So we have to attack the cause and resolve the problem. We have to get people out in the sun. We have to have you know, a, a modification of the diet. We can't live on processed foods and sugar and low in protein. It just doesn't work. Uh, we have to decrease our, our, our EMF exposure, this overexposure to, to indoor lights and to um, you know, microwave radiation and, and cell phone towers and all these different kinds of things. A uh, lack of movement and physical strain is a big problem we need to exercise. We need to stimulate the muscles, resistance training, Pilates, weightlifting calisthenics, all these different types of things, change our physiology by stimulating the muscles and the muscles and joints drive the brain activity through different sensory reception. Microbiome imbalance, which is the bacterial colony that lives in our gut. Um, and that also affects intestinal barrier issues. And that creates what we call a leaky gut. Chemical and metal toxicity, which is very common, overstimulation from these smartphones we were talking about, sleep disruption, food sensitivities. Also, we have to throw in mold, which is another big issue. Um, and we have to look at all these things. I mean, we've, you know, this is just a repeat of, of what I've been saying, but, you know, if you look at down at the bottom, these epigenetic changes, like that gene I was telling you about, MTHFR, there are other ones called MAO and COMT. These are all SNPs that are responsible for making serotonin and dopamine or involved in the, in the processing of, of serotonin and dopamine. And we can have these alterations and they're very common and we're all differently affected by stress and by inflammation. Some people are very resilient because they don't have these particular things. Some people are less resilient because they do have them. So it's not like a one, one size fits all. Infections, we know that infections can change the brain. Like a young a kid can have multiple strep infections and then that strep can cross the blood brain barrier and cause a problem called PANDAS or pediatric autoimmune neurological disorder associated with strep. They're also called, of course, PANS, which is another infection uh, commonly by mycoplasma or even Lyme disease that can upregulate inflammation in the brain, even candidiasis, which is, um, you know, like an, a chronic uh, yeast infection. All of these things can impact the brain, and yet we're not searching for them. So how many of these things are being evaluated for? And the answer is next to none. And that's just not acceptable. Here's more about the gut dysbiosis. So here's from gut dysbiosis to altered brain function and mental illness from 2016. So we've known this for a while. Evidence is emerging now that through interactions with the gut-brain axis, uh, axis, the bidirectional communication system between the central nervous system and the gastrointestinal tract exists. Modifications of the microbiome can induce depressive-like behaviors, meaning if you have an unhealthy gut, or you have an increase in abnormal bacteria in the gut and a decrease in healthy bacteria that we usually refer to as probiotics, a uh, commensal bacteria, that can induce depressive-like behavior. Although an association between gut issues and psychiatric conditions has long been recognized, it now appears that gut microbes represent direct mediators of psychopathology. And, and this, is, you know, this isn't a new journal article, so we've known this for a while. Here's another biggie, because if you go back to my original chart, you know, one of the things was concussion or traumatic brain injury, because we know that when somebody has a head trauma, it causes neuroinflammation. And that's why there's such a significant increase in people with head trauma and anxiety and depression. And, and this is related to the NFL and CTE, which is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So we know that there's a direct correlation between these things. And I always ask patients who come in to see me, um, with any of these chronic neurological issues, have you ever hit your head? And generally what I hear is, I've never been knocked out. So they equate being unconscious with a concussion. And that's just not true. Almost hardly any concussions actually render somebody unconscious. 
So a concussion is much, much less than being knocked out. But these, these micro traumas, even multiple small injuries to the, to the head can create this whole thing. So depressive disorders develop commonly among people's, people with TBI. Within this range, most experts on the subject accept an estimated first year post-TBI or concussion depression frequency in the range of 25 to 50% and lifetime rates of 26 to 64%. I mean, that is unacceptable that we know this. And when people have these traumas, we generally send them home and we say, just keep an eye on them. Make sure they're okay. And if if after, you know, after after a week they start feeling better, we dismiss it as being passed. But what's left is this chronic inflammatory issue and functional neurological issues and, and commonly involving eye movements and brainstem involvement and so on. It's a topic for another day. But depressive disorders following TBI were significantly associated with the presence of anxiety. Uh, approximately three quarters of patients with depression had coexistent anxiety. This is another one on the gut, 2022, intestinal permeability in depressed uh, and depression in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. So again, we know that this thing called calprotectin, which is a measure of intestinal inflammation, is useful in differentiating inflammatory bowel disease from irritable bowel. So when the you know somebody can have chronic diarrhea, constipation, bloating, gas, um, abdominal discomfort, and so on, if they have inflammation, we generally say it's inflammatory bowel disease and it's Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. If they don't have inflammation, we say that it's irritable bowel syndrome. But either way, we can measure these calprotectin levels from stool. And when somebody has a, a level, you know, that's approaching 50, that's elevated. And elevated inflammation in the gut reflexes back to the brain. We now know that there's many studies now connecting um, Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease with, inf you know, inflammation in the gut. So we know that there's a direct correlation, a direct connect between gut issues and brain issues and we can't ignore it anymore. And again, I was mentioning these different SNPs before, these different genetic issues. And I was talking about these different cycles, like this is called MTHFR. Basically, in a nutshell, these imagine that these gears, this looks like a very complicated biochemical series of reactions, and it is, but I'm gonna just break it down very quickly. THF is folate or folic acid, it's vitamin B9. We can't use it in the form of folate. We have to convert it into a human form called methylfolate or 5-methyltetrahydrofolate. We have an enzyme that our body makes called MTHFR that allows us to convert it into the human form. Once it's created, it goes into this cycle with this arrow going this way, and this is what we call the methylation cycle. And this is involved in uh, ca maintaining uh, cancer reduction, heart disease risk. Um, it works on our detoxification pathways. It regenerates and, and maintains our DNA, like very, very important stuff. But when it goes this way, it allows tryptophan and tyrosine, which are amino acids that we get from eating protein, to turn into serotonin and dopamine. So if we have a mutation in the genes that make this enzyme, we can actually reduce the amount of tryptophan and tyrosine conversion to serotonin and dopamine. And then to complicate matters even more, we can have these other SNPs and these other genes that make these enzymes called COMT and MAO. But again, it gets deeper and deeper, not something that we can't deal with because we understand this. This has been going on for a long time. So let me tell you about a couple of cases. This is a 33-year-old female, five foot seven, 198 pounds, severe depression, headaches, chronic neck pain, chronic disabling fatigue, IBS uh, with constipation, lifelong with nausea and bloating, suicidal ideation, um, eating the standard American diet, had 12 electroconvulsive therapy treatments in 2018. She had 13 years prior to her presentation, she had a head trauma uh, where she was involved in a skiing accident, uh, accident and she was referred by her psychologist. Now, this is a girl who was severely, severely depressed. She was taking lithium, 900 milligrams a day, uh, buspirone, 30 milligrams, Raylar, 3 milligrams, omeprazole for the chronic gut issues, birth control. And despite taking all these medications, including Clozaril, which was now discontinued, the patient continued to suffer. So when we did the labs, what we realized was that there was an elevated high sensitivity CRP. This is what we were talking about before, about the inflammatory marker. So boom, here it is. 
very low iron and iron saturation, low vitamin D, this gene meet, this gene issue, this MTHFR issue, another one called MAO, significant sensitivities to dairy. So all of these different issues, they're all metabolic issues on top of weight loss resistance, lack of exercise, chronic fatigue, all these different things. We're just creating this negative vicious cycle. Uh, when we look at her stool, what we see is a significant aberration in the way her body is, is dealing. So she has these abnormal bacteria. These are dysbiotic or overgrowth bacteria. So she has very high levels of staph and strep. Um, she has an imbalance in these phyla between the, these, these two main phyla that, that are basically representing 95% of the bacteria, way too many. She has an immune system dysfunction because her secretory IgA in the gut is very, very low. But look at her calprotectin, very, very high. So as we get to 173, we start worrying about inflammatory bowel disease, and we start worrying about Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. So we know we have inflammation in the gut. The follow-up. So after addressing these inflammatory lab abnormalities, the gut dysfunction through a lifestyle management program, lifestyle management, positive thinking, nutrition, diet, exercise, uh, gut remediation through re reworking the, the microbiome um, over a three month period, a total reduction in depression. Her high sensitivity CRP went from 7.1, which is very high because one to three is normal, to 1.2 in three months. Her energy level and sociability have both significantly improved. She's been feeling so good that she's joined the gym and is beginning a resistance weight training program that we created for her. Her psychologist is thrilled with the improvements, and her psychiatrist is as well, and he's willing to discuss slowly tapering her meds. I mean, this is a significant, significant change in somebody who's been suffering with this for decades. Here's, a, here's another case, 14-year-old female, 5'6", 115 pounds, severe depression, headaches, chronic fatigue, abdominal discomfort, vomits regularly, in fact, daily when stressed. Suicidal ideation since 10 years old, and now it's a daily or weekly occurrence. Uh, multiple hospitalizations for suicidal ideation. Uh, standard American diet, taking Lexapro 20 milligrams a day. Discontinued Prozac because it increased her feelings of killing herself. Uh, referred by a psychologist. Elevated high sensitivity CRP. Again, the magic, the magic inflammatory number. Very low iron and iron saturation. Low vitamin D. These genetic markers, again, sensitivities to foods, inflammatory dysbiosis, abnormal gut. Again, you know, we're seeing the same things, just elevated levels of abnormal bacteria, uh, methanobacter, methanobacter family, which is involved in something called SIBO. So following up, after addressing these lab abnormalities and a gut remediation program and all the different things that we did, we have a whole program. Um, she experienced 14 straight days without suicidal ideation for the first time in two years. And this is after three months. A mother states that she's at a point where she feels comfortable being alone so mom could start leaving her for work again. For the first time in, in four years, she started uh, She started feeling sick, actually. She, started, she got a cold and didn't totally decompensate. Mom called me and said, I, I can't even believe it because anytime this this, you know, my daughter would get sick, it would literally like, bring her all the way back to square one and we'd start all over again. And she said, you know what? She was like every other kid that just got a cold. So here's case three, 42 year old female, five feet tall, 173 pounds, lifelong anxiety, depression symptoms, diagnosed with bipolar, chronic daily headaches, chronic fatigue, can sleep up to 20 hours per day, irritable bowel syndrome, constipation, no libido, standard American diet, no regular exercise, recent severe depressive episode. Really, really like unable to work, unable to function. Very low ferritin, uh, very low amino acids, low vitamin D, blood markers for celiac disease. Um, MTHFR, again, homozygous 677, intestinal inflammation, and uh, intestinal insufficiency dysbiosis, a little different presentation, but again, chronic inflammation and all of these different markers. Again, you can see here, instead of having very high levels of, you know, the bacteria, the abnormal bacteria, she has uh, normal bacteria. She has very, very low levels. We call this insufficiency dysbiosis. 
But look at her calprotectin number here. It's supposed to be less than 50. She's at 460. Now, the, the challenge here is that when presented with this evidence, she was unable to follow through. And this is the biggest challenge we have as clinicians because we need somebody to understand that it's work. It's, it's a lot of work to make these changes. It's not easy to change our diet. It's not easy to, um, to get out in the sun. It's not easy to, to make lifestyle changes. And unfortunately, I, I didn't have the opportunity to work with this patient. Um, you know, because of that. And, you know, it's, I'm sure it won't be the last time. But the point that I wanted to make was that we need, we owe it to patients to look at the big picture, to see what's possible for them, and to help them to see what's possible, and to work with the the referring psychologists and, and therapists and psychiatrists as a team, so we can help resolve underlying um, contributory um, or even causative factors and then help the doctors who are managing them work, you know, help their work to, uh, to actually manifest. So, you know, people don't need a pill. They need a program. They need an integrative program uh, that incorporates a functional approach to health uh, with what we call the STAR exercises, which, which is a program that uh, we've created at Same Here, and a great therapist. They need a careful assessment that includes a history of infections, head trauma, chemical exposure, previous uh, drug use. They need a careful evaluation of their exercise, dietary, and sunlight habits. And they need blood, urine, stool, and genetic profiles. You know, only then can we create an individualized program of care that guarantees greater levels of success than we currently experience. This is just my information, but I am part of such a much bigger team at Same Here. Uh, like I said before, you know, I've been able to pull together some top minds in the functional health world around the country and even in Canada. Um, and it's called the Functional Doctors Alliance uh, for Same Here Global. So if you check out uh, samehere.org, samehereglobal.org, and then you can look at the Psych Alliance and see Dr. Pleaner and see the work that we're doing. And we're really trying to make a difference. And I think that this, this presentation just adds another layer of understanding that there's a physiological piece and we need to be attacking it from every angle.